Hello all, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, The Great Decoupling, U.S. versus China. Please note that all attendees are muted and you are in chat-only mode. So as the discussion unfolds, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box. And now it is my pleasure to hand things off to CEO Coaching International's President and COO, Randy Dewey. Thank you, Nyleen. And welcome everyone to CEO Coaching's International webcast, The Great Decoupling. It's an exciting topic for me, and i uh, introduce myself quickly, and then I'll turn it over to our esteemed guest here. Uh, my name is Randy Dewey. I'm the president and COO of CEO Coaching International. I myself have spent over three decades working and traveling through Asia, built factories in China and Korea and Vietnam. So this topic, the great decoupling between the U.S. and China, is a really important topic, one for me personally, uh, with lots of uh, friends and associates abroad, uh, but also very important to our clients. And judging by the overwhelming sign-up to this webcast, there's obviously significant interest in the topic and lots to unpack here. Uh, today, I have the privilege of introducing you to Diana Choileva. She's recognized as one of the foremost experts in China politics, as well as the economy. Uh, she is the chief economist to Endo uh, Economics, an independent macroeconomic, as well as political forecasting company that she founded in 2016. And of course, it has a focus on the topic. It has a focus on China and the global impact. Uh, Diana has been uh, covering China for well over two decades, and she's co-written three books on the topic. So prior to Endo, uh, she worked at Lombard Street Research, now called uh, T.S. Lombard, for 16 years, uh, most recently as their chief economist, as well as the head of uh, research. Diana has a master's degree in economics from Warwick University and writes regular opinion pieces for the Financial Times, as well as the Wall Street Journal, uh, Foreign Policies, and other. Uh, she's also a regular commentary on Bloomberg, as well as BBC and CNBC, as, as well as others. So judging by the avalanche of interest, Diana, we have a number of people that signed up for this webcast, huge interest. Obviously, it's a top of mind topic. So, so welcome, Diana, uh, today to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you today on the, on the show. Thank you very much, Randy. It's my pleasure, and I can't wait for us to get stuck in. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe with that, let me set the stage a little bit, because obviously this topic on the great decoupling uh, has some history to it. First and foremost, if you went all the way back to the 70s, you know, really that's when China's economy really opened up. Major econ you know, economies in the U.S. as well as Japan and Europe, they were hunting for low-cost uh, country options, low-cost solutions, and China really popped up in that period of time as really a great solution for it. There was lots of appeal, like there was lots of business happening obviously in Hong Kong as well as South Korea and Taiwan, but they were advancing quite significantly and weren't necessarily that low cost option. But, uh, and of course, North America was in the, the hunt for that. And of course there was labor shortages in that time. So the stage was set just, you know, based on uh, the needs and the and the the requirements, of course, and then China just really took off. But back in the 70s, I think the national uh, income average was $155 per capita, which obviously has uh, changed dramatically over the last 40 years, and its economy has grown at really unprecedented rates. And uh, here we are now in the situation where China is not necessarily that low cost option. Uh, obviously, you know, back in 2005, I think you know, China, when they really initiated that major change towards uh, science and technology and, of course, engineering and math, and they had this real push towards advancement of technology as well as education, which really, you know, played a significant uh, part over 2005, around 2010-12, you started to see the uh, the mighty five, which would be Vietnam, India, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, starting to really come up uh, as an option, that low-cost uh, solution. And so you've seen the likes of Samsung and Intel, Adidas, Nike, you know, making that move towards these countries that were really uh, creating, you know, that solution that once was there for China, but now is was less so. Um, then 2018, the Trump administration started to use the word decoupling, uh, reducing dependency, and all of a sudden, you know, what was had already begun now was really getting, uh, you know, magnified, I would say. Uh, and there was really that discouragement towards importing and uh, trying to repatriate jobs, the mighty five, but also, you know, repatriation of work towards uh, the United States. So, 
but over the last 40 years, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a significant amount of investment. Billions of dollars have been really put into the Chinese economy as companies, tens of thousands of companies have really used that as a solution. So here we are today, you know, it seems like in, in some respects we've crossed the Rubicon and now there's momentum in this direction. So the first question is, you know, is it a point of no return? Is there, is there a blend in the middle? What would you, what's your view be, uh, uh, about you know sort of the macro question about the great decoupling? Is it as uh, significant as we read, or is there more in the details? It's by far the most important driving force in the world today and for decades to come, from which everything will fall out. To be honest, I, I often say that. Uh, if you want to be a good forecaster, the aim of the game is to figure out what will be the key global driving force and then how will that uh, impact everything else. And since really 2017, 2018, our key thematic story was what we actually termed the great decoupling. We even bought the domain name, thegreatdecoupling.com. Uh, and it was much more an all encompassing geopolitical confrontation between the existing hegemon America and the aspiring one, China. And actually, China itself was on a route to decoupling. The sort of two political changes that made a huge impact was when Xi Jinping came to power uh, as uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party General Secretary, in 2013, by 2015, it was quite clear the path that she was taking China on, one very much of self-sufficiency made in China 2025, one which also by 2017, she stood up and said, China has stood up and it's ready to take it the way the Chinese see it, rightful place in the world. Uh, and on the other side of the equation, when Trump got elected as president in the United States, that was the other critical political change, if you'd like, because essentially, originally, he wasn't really kind of knowing what he was doing necessarily. He was focusing on the trade um, um, surplus and deficit from the perspective, really. But that, that was, if you'd like, the symptom of the malaise, not the malaise itself. Then he got onto technology, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, he really, what he made possible by being so, if you'd like, politically incorrect, was for everyone with a gripe against China to be able to speak up. And we had this explosion of, um, uh, of free acknowledgement of all the problems that were going on in the period between I would the other big big marker uh, that Randy we should mention is the entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001 Absolutely. because really at that point after the fall of the Berlin Wall on all the sort of hubris and enthusiasm America decided well let's integrate economically China into our system uh, and they allowed it to enter WTO on the premise that it will quickly become a market-driven economy and then the hope that further down the line, as incomes rose, politically, the Chinese will sort of conclude that the democratic system is the best. But what happened was that actually um, they were very slow in terms of uh, Re re reforming the Chinese economy, turning it into a fully fledged market economy. And as a result, we had this really clash between a sort of hybrid command economy, market economy system, which was ginormous, with the free liberal world. And that amalgamation did not work. Very simplistically, China was still administering the price of capital the price of electricity, and because it was so large and started grabbing export market share like crazy, it started distorting globally the cost of capital, et cetera, et cetera. So the economics globally weren't working, and then we got the critical political mass by the time Trump was uh, elected from both sides to start what is a great power competition to a very different ideologies. 
So, it, you know, if you think about, how, you know, how far can the decoupling actually go? Specific technologies. There's a lot of things that, you know, of course, China's being the, one of the biggest debt holders of America's debt. So you've got some major pulls that are behind the curtain. At the same token, you have business that has now been, you know, a, a bit concerned, I would say heightened concerned over the last couple of years that the decoupling needs to be underway because there's lots of pressure now coming from various constituents within the supply chain. How far do you, you, you believe that the decoupling will actually go? Well, look, that actually is a difficult question to answer because the world is highly integrated when it comes both to manufacturing but also global capital markets, of course, not in terms of labor necessarily. Yeah. And also, technology has changed dramatically uh, the rules of the game, if you'd like. So uh, what is clear, 100% clear, is that to decouple, uh, any sort of level of decoupling will be hugely costly mm -hmm. because the decoupling is not driven because it's cost effective uh, even though to be honest you were alluding to the fact that it actually had become continuously more expensive to produce in china but its scale there were other things that that were going for it and it's not really the cost motive here. It is the geopolitical imperative on both sides of the equation. I think this is very important to realize. It's not that America wants to decouple or the West wants to decouple. China wants to decouple itself. It wants to become self-sufficient within its sphere of influence. But it was hoping that it will have a, a, a bit longer to be able to absorb and uh, hopefully innovate itself all the necessary technology that it still needs from the west uh, unfortunately well not unfortunately i would say fortunately <laughs> for those in the western world uh, america finally woke up to the challenge that china presented uh, and uh, sort of has been on a very concerted uh, effort not necessarily with a very clear uh, and well thought out and coherent strategy, certainly more effective strategy since Biden took over, uh, but it is also on the strategy to uh, contain China's rise because China presents um, really a big geopolitical threat. So all of this is the key driver here, not uh, where it is cheaper to, to produce uh, and where it is not, and as such will have you know, global productivity will come down and costs will continue to rise. Um, and we are in a world, if you'd like, of cost push inflation uh, and a stagflationary world because productivity is coming down simultaneously. So that's not great for the world economy. And uh, I keep joking that uh, if there was a Martian up there, he's probably looking down at Earth saying, what are these humans doing, you know? The last 30 years have been the best time in history in terms of the progress humans made. But when you look at that progress, you find that that's a very unequal progress. And also it's a progress that has created a lot of uh, uh, social division. And um, back on Earth, it seems that everything people like probably 99% of the population globally looks at all this through the prism of their own nationality, not being Earth people. So for a Martian, it seems totally um, crazy the why we are disentangling this finely tuned global industrial supply chain, manufacturing system, capital markets. But um, down here on Earth, we seem to be driven primarily uh, by uh, the geopolitical ideological clash between two um, existing and aspiring superpowers. So if you if you take it uh, down to the level of a company, you know you, you see a lot of uh, pressure now coming to bear. We've got supply chain issues on the Pacific Ocean. We've got issues of delivery. Low cost country solutions are are continuing to pressure. We've got a, a heightened uh, in, inflation, uh, inflationary problem. How do companies take a look at this from your perspective on how to actually approach it? 
uh, by the way, I'm not sure if I'm frozen for you. Uh, I certainly see myself frozen here. Uh, hopefully not for 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 everyone else. Uh, but uh, at least if I'm frozen, you can hear me. We can hear you well, and you are frozen. But go ahead, your voice no, isn't. Well, well, I'm not going to mess around <laughs> with the connection, trying and freeze it. Uh, <laughs> even though it's quite a strange face I see no, here. But hopefully it will kick in uh, properly. But. Um, Yes, you know, from a corporate perspective, it is very complicated. I think, um, uh, especially from a multinational perspective, because pretty much everyone out there wants to have their cake and eat it, and also finds it very difficult to disentangle. It is hugely costly, and it's not necessarily the case that the state will cover this cost, if you see what I mean. Uh, and also, the rules are not pretty clear that the direction of travel, the strategy in, you know, with the companies that I talk to advise, they struggle a lot to figure out um, under what framework are they operating, both within China itself, but also with respect to their, their own country's policy uh, framework towards China. And this is kind of the confusion in the strategy that I was describing earlier, because um, to some extent, the West also wants to have its cake and eat it in terms of policymakers. They want to have engagement with China in certain areas, and they want to contain China and its right in uh, and its rise in others. And China uh, is resisting that type of um, of cooperation naturally. Uh, if the if the tables were turned, it would have been the other way around as well. Uh, but you know, national governments not uh, stating very clearly um, what are actually, where is this going, and, and is it likely to, to be going down that route, uh, is making it hard for corporates. Uh, and um, simultaneously, you know, what I'm observing is that originally a lot of corporates were sort of looking at this, okay, you know, it's import tariffs, costs are going up, let's move to a lower cost location. But since the Ukraine war, and that was really the turning point, um, I think there is now a widespread realization that, um, you know what, this is a geopolitical issue. We are talking about French shoring, uh, et cetera, et cetera, near shoring. And um, a lot of corporates don't like to talk about it. A lot of, there is a lot of actually uh, relocation already kind of underway uh, from China. But corporates also don't want to talk about it because they fear being pen penalized in China and, and you know, encountering all sorts of problems if they announce to the world that they're moving. And in that sense, when you ask me how far has the decoupling gone, I think it's probably further than the impression we get from the general media reports or looking at the overall statistics. Because um, that change um, is not necessarily Recorded uh, as yet, if you see what I mean, in in the in the the, the types of statistics that are that, that are uh, taking a while to be collected, that people are trying to to keep it quiet that they are moving. Um, others are actually though um, doubling down on China, and there's still quite a lot of countries and multinationals that are trying to have their cake and eat it still. So, you know, that's the, it's a great point because there's some very sophisticated supply chain networks that have been built. It took decades to put them together. So it's not so easy to deconstruct those and move them to other countries. And in some cases where technology would be limiting, uh, it's not so easy to put it into other, you know, the Mighty Five, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, they don't have the educational system. They don't have necessarily the, uh, the degree of engineering and technology. So you're going to be quite limited on the ability. It took China a long time to get to the level of stand, you know, standards of quality in automotive and in other uh, technology areas, uh, uh, space. Uh, these technologies are advancing, but recently with AI and virtual reality, the 5G network, soon to be 6G network, there, there's some interesting uh, technologies that have been put into China that have been part of uh, the ecosystem. Uh, where do you see some of these technologies, of course, because they do have some national security implications. So there's going to be some push in certain sectors that are going to, it's going to be stronger and more pre uh, prevalent. Uh, where, do, where do you see that as uh, playing into this? 
Absolutely. Great question, Randy, because obviously, you know, where, where you're going to source shoes from is <laughs> a, a different question to uh, where you're going to source uh, critical technology or critical commodities. Uh, but the technology aspect is the critical aspect of this uh, race for supremacy, if you'd like, because ultimately uh, the winner of the technology race will be the future global hegemon. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting from that point of view is, and why really both countries and multinationals, etc., need to pick a side, is because the world is bifurcating in these two spheres of influence, a Chinese and an American. It's not balkanizing into lots of little um, or in, in, in you know, multiple power and economic centers. And the reason for that is that the two countries that are so far ahead technologically than anyone else are China and the US. So places like Europe or India, let alone Russia now, you know, it, it seems such a much more diminished state that we imagined it to be before the Ukraine war. And none of them are anywhere near to be able to compete. And because of technology being absolute essential part of everything and going to be even more so in the future um, and in that sense everything becomes a weapon e you know you could get uh, you know or everything becomes a, a potentially a, with a military use then you really need to pick one or the other because you will not be able to compete creating your own infrastructure your own system etc etc so America has been very successful in trying to constrain China's access to advanced semiconductors and not so advanced semiconductors anymore and the entire supply chain into uh, roping in um, the critical allies needed for this, such as uh, obviously Taiwan, uh, for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we'll come to discussing, Japan, uh, South Korea, the Netherlands, um, etc. And um, there will be more to come down this route. There is no way the US will roll back. In fact, we expect uh, more measures to come uh, that are constraining not just from a supply point of view, uh, but also from the perspective of investment uh, and uh, capital finance for, for all those industries. And if you think, just as we step back for a moment and look at the actual Chinese companies, what do you think is going, you know, it's been some of the implications or what type of strategies do you think they're deploying? They obviously have been, uh, you know, they've been supplying American business. However, uh, now if, if they're, you know, the flow, I guess, uh, the orders for them are starting to go down as, as people are looking at alternatives. What do you think that means for Chinese business? Well, the grand vision of uh, the Communist Party is that uh, they turn China itself and its 1.4 billion people as the final consumer within their geopolitical sphere of influence, where they themselves outsource the low cost production to uh, the, the countries that will be feeding into their system and they become the high um, value added producer as well as the consumer of final resort. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously up until now, and then of course we can debate and discuss whether they'll be able to achieve that, but that is the vision. Uh, it has been the US and, and generally the Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, but the US by far the biggest sort of consumer of last resort in the world. Uh, and for, for, for a number of years, this worked because China was overproducing, um, you know, keeping its costs low, uh, but it was relying on the rest of the world to be the final consumer. And uh, at some point, because China was so big, the rest of the world was not just big enough to simply allow China a continuous rise of the value added chain unless China generated its own consumer demand. And I posit that if in about 2004 or 2005, actually at that point, China had allowed fully market forces to determine the cost of capital, i.e. allowed free movement of capital and unpegged its exchange rate, uh, then we wouldn't have had the buildup of debt that uh, followed in America, in the Anglo-Saxon countries, 
which of course, uh, because again, China was so big at some point became unsustainable and that kicked off the global financial crisis. And since the global financial crisis, China itself has been struggling to figure out what its model of development is going to be. It used to be a very low debt uh, model where they were just grabbing export market share, but that changed. And sort of the old model where they threw money at unproductive investment because they had a continuous stream of export income disappeared. And then to do the same mode without sort of generating genuine consumption, uh, meant that their debt to GDP ratio started exploding and now they have a serious excess debt problem themselves. You know, let's let's switch the topic a little bit towards Taiwan. Obviously, you know, uh, as we've seen, uh, there's been a lot of tension, a lot of tension over the uh, South China Sea, a lot of tension between those two countries. Uh, but it plays a very significant role. Taiwan, over the years, has been a powerhouse for semiconductors, uh, has an incredible amount of technologies, lots of dependency and reliance uh, on the U.S. with Taiwan in that relationship. Uh, but it's now caught in the middle of, uh, you know, a very tense situation uh, with China. How do you see that playing out, and wh what what could we anticipate uh, is going to be some of the shifting uh, tides there? Well. Taiwan really is a, a critical piece of the puzzle when trying to figure out if we could have a, um, a peaceful divorce uh, <laughs> or an acrimonious uh, divorce, one which could potentially uh, end up with a military conflict between uh, China and the US. And um, the thinking goes as follows. Um, the Chinese Communist Party, unification with Taiwan, is uh, almost its reason for existence. It's unfinished business. They have promised the Chinese people they will unify. And originally the deadline, if you'd like, was 1949, and it was sort of at the back of everyone's mind. But um, for China, for the PLA, for Beijing, it was always um, part of the long-term vision of getting stronger economically and technolog technologically, developing their military, uh, and then um, being in a position to unify with Taiwan. And originally, the hope was that they could do that uh, peacefully, and they used sort of more of a stick than a carrot. But um, the story changed, not least post the arrival of, uh, well, most importantly because of the arrival of Xi Jinping because all of a sudden the horizon changed because she everything that we've analyzed about him in terms of what he's done what he said wants to be the leader that unifies China with Taiwan and so in that sense the timeline shifted to at most 2035 then um, it became really a dynamic because the unification with Taiwan is no longer just in China's hands because the U.S. woke up to the challenge and started, uh, you know, dramatically changing its Indo-Pacific strategy, focus on Taiwan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So China began feeling under pressure that time is slipping, that the window of opportunity to take Taiwan is changing. And for the U.S., it's also, so while Taiwan, reunification with Taiwan uh, for the Communist Party is, is really fundamental, existential, uh, a matter of, of utmost honor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for the U.S., it's about its um, continued role as a global hegemon and uh, uh, having the, the role over the Indo-Pacific and the free movement of navigation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. If the U.S. were uh, to um, see Taiwan unify with China, its role in the world will change dramatically. Uh, at the moment, I don't get any sense from, and, and I talk to a lot of the senior U.S. policymakers, I don't get any sense that America is anyway thinking of, of, of that scenario. If Taiwan were to decide, oh, you know what, we do actually want to peacefully unify with, with China, then actually America doesn't have a strategy because then, then that's it. They can't uh, sort of come to Taiwan's rescue. But what happened was that the Taiwanese over time developed their own identity. The majority of them now are born Taiwanese, not Chinese. And progressively, they turned into a functioning democracy. 
and really the straw that kind of broke the camel's back was what happened in Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong and its two country, one system, or two systems, one country idea, was kind of the model apartment for showcase to the Taiwanese to buy into that model. With the protests, with Xi squashing them down, the reassertion of control uh, across Hong Kong by China, all of that really was a huge wake up call for the Taiwanese that um, really these two systems, one country doesn't, is not a formula that they will be willing to, to accept. So at this present stage, we have a Taiwan that doesn't want to be unified peacefully. We have mm -hmm. a China which wants to do that in a much shorter time frame, and we have a US that wants to prevent China from doing it. So then, uh, maybe actually your camera's still frozen. Uh, maybe you could turn it off and turn it back on again on the control panel. That might help re reset it. Um, we've been getting a flood of questions uh, that's coming in from the audience, and it's been really quite fascinating um, as uh, as we see a lot of interest, uh, you know, for this topic. But the questions are really specific, and there's a lot of questions coming in. So what I'd like to do is just sort of walk through some of the most uh, significant questions and, uh, and and ask you those questions. Um, judging by the number of questions here, we won't get to them all. And I just want to remind the audience that CEO Coaching International, we have many former CEOs with extensive experience in China and the, and the Mighty Five. So uh, if you'd like to unpack your question, if I don't get to it, please feel free to uh, click the link and book a complimentary call with one of our experts to help you unpack some of your specific concerns and uh, some of the areas of uh, that are top of mind for, for you and for your company specifically. So it looks like you're back and the refresh of your camera worked I well. So. In animated form. <laughs> I, I, I don't dare drink some water in case that, that was jinxing and I get <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you the first question here, and it's how has the U.S.-China trade war impacted the global economy, and what do you think are some of the long-term consequences that people maybe aren't thinking about? I think at this point, we sort of passed the, the trade war. If we look at the trade war, just simply uh, constrained uh, along the lines of, of the uh, import tariffs and the trade relationship between China and the US. It sort of transcended to tech war, to Taiwan war. And actually, uh, we, when we came up with the great decoupling thesis, we split it in, in three, trade war, tech war, Taiwan war, largely because it sounded nice with TTT. But if you look at the trade war, we there bunched up all the overall economic relationship including capital markets and i think the next phase within the economic aspect of, of of this confrontation will be what happens and how will also the decoupling affect uh, capital markets globally uh, which will have uh, also uh, uh, an impact on the cost of capital so you you are likely to see an increase in the cost of capital increase in in uh, costs generally from a uh, production supply chain decoupling point of view, and it is a you know totally different paradigm in which every single business will have to be operating. But the good news is that if we manage to avoid a military conflict, actually there will be a lot of opportunities in the respective spheres of influence. Uh, mm. To, to develop and to progress in a different way. Yeah. So let me try and move through a bunch of these questions here. So the next question says, do you foresee the strength and perception of U.S. intellectual property decreasing in value over the next 10 years? For example, a lot of patents, a lot of infringements have taken place. What kind of impact is it going to have on U.S. IP? Is it going to decrease over the next 10 years or not? Well, look, I mean, you know, to be frank about it, China has been, you know, wherever possible, it was getting the IP um, legally, but wherever not possible, it was simply stealing it. And um, for a long time, the U.S. corporates that were um, at the receiving end of this, or the European corporates that were at the receiving end of this, were not really kicking up a fuss about it themselves, um, you know, 
call it sort of uh, false confidence, but they were like, oh, okay, let them get this, they'll never catch up. And all of a sudden, the situation is very different from that perspective. China has made huge headway in its technological advancement, and actually in certain areas now of new technologies is, take for example, electrical vehicles, is the leader, or mobile payments, is the leader itself. So there has been this wake-up call, which um, seems to be boiling down to education, uh, freedom of um, sort of speech and ideas, and kind of with the conclusion that uh, America, as a result, will keep its edge uh, when it comes to technological advancement, and China will invariably decline. And if that was sort of 30 years ago, I would probably be in that boat, but I do ask myself the following question, uh, which makes the story more complicated, and in, in the context of it, you, you can understand why the US is focusing so uh, forcefully on, on, on the semiconductor side, because mm -hmm. Actually, we now have data as almost the fourth factor of production. Typically, you think of capital, labor, uh, and their combined productivity. But because of where we are with technology, data itself and how it can be utilized productively becomes this really important resource. And China has way more of it and is going to get way more of it. They are on a massive digitalization drive across the whole uh, economy to collect everything, to centralize, to be able to look at it, and then to use computing power for machine learning. And at the end of the day, even if the data is of lower quality, let's say, or even the argument that um, it's not free will, so the data is not real, people are not expressed, the free will comes into much later, you know, very simplistic uh, exchanges between people. Um, they they will not, you know, that data will actually be be good data. Whereas in the West we have data privacy, we don't collect data in the same way. So we are at a disadvantage of, of having a pool of data that we can use like this. And so for China to progress, the plus is that it has all the data. It has the computing power, but of course, that's where the advanced semiconductors are coming into it, and that's how America is trying to, to slow China down. But should the Chinese find their own way of uh, getting there in terms of indigenous innovation, then actually uh, the West will be under more threat. So uh, at the moment, uh, it doesn't seem like the Chinese are there. They are seriously hurting from that point of view, even though there's loads of countries, companies that are trying to evade the sanctions and things are still flowing into China. Uh, but, you know, hopefully uh, sort of the screws will be tightening on that. Um, but it is not a, um, I don't think a, a kind of foregone conclusion that uh, China's system uh, will will uh, fail to, to to take advantage of this new world order or this new industrial revolution or technological revolution, if you'd like. You know, the I, I would say the number one question that has come in from if I looked at all of the questions that have flowed in, it's it's really the, it goes down to this question: Is it risky to continue to make products in China and or Taiwan, and should companies be considering alternatives in order to protect themselves? Absolutely, uh, yes, uh, but of course it depends on who you are, because if you are, let's say, HSBC sitting there on the on the crest of the tectonic shift, shift uh, there is no way HSBC can stay the global bank that it is. It's just not, uh, you know, not not feasible. Um, and there are other multinationals that are, are not of such strategic value, producing, I don't know, candy, or, you know, I'm thinking maybe of Mars, you know, with candy and, and dog food, et cetera, et cetera, that, um, you know, this kind of geopolitical aspect um, is, is not as pronounced. So uh, then, of course, if you are an American uh, corporate, uh, it's a very different story than if you are a, a Thai corporate or an Indonesian corporate or 
a European corporate. Any, uh, I, I think corporates need to pick essentially which uh, sphere of influence they need to and they want to be part of. And the more strategically critical your uh, service or goods that you are producing, trading are, the sooner you need to uh, to, to be having those contingencies <coughs> and trying to plan differently. Obviously, if you are based in Taiwan, um, it's it's you know an extremely dangerous place. Sorry, excuse me for a second. <coughs> So why don't you take that drink, even, and I don't think it'll freeze your camera again, but while you're doing that, um, Thank you. The, con the contrary um, quote, which I, I found fascinating from Christine Lagarde, which was the president of, of course, of the European Central Bank, uh, and I'll quote what she said. She said, w this, you know, th this is in relationship to a China-US uh, split in uh, the decoupling. It would lead to less economic growth less prosperity in the world, more poverty across the world. So I think that this is something we should be all uh, avoiding. So it was pretty grand statement from her uh, with a bit of a draconian sort of view of, uh, of, the, of the decoupling. Um, history, if it was to prove itself, whenever someone steps out of something, somebody else steps in. So it will you know, create a, a, a vacuum in some respects, but, but that typically gets taken up. But, what, what do you think of her statement and, and what should companies be concerned about if, uh, if that's the case? Well, look, um, you know, this is going back to the point uh, that I was making with my Martian, <laughs> who may or may not exist. Um, it is not, if you're looking at it from a cost-benefit rational point of view uh, and an economic uh, cost-benefit, uh, then this doesn't make sense. Right, but the problem is that the driver, the the driving factors behind this are not uh, purely cost push in a world where we are all living together happily and we don't care about nationality and whose ideological system uh, is, um, what, you know, is is the one that's around or not. So really, <laughs> for someone like Christine Lagarde to say all this, it's 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 too late in a way. Um, you know, this is the direction of travel. I think the best we could hope for, unless there is a dramatic change of leadership. So unless China all of a sudden stops being communist and wants to become a market-driven economy, or unless the US stops being a market-driven liberal economy and wants to become communist, unless those things happen. This is the direction, the direction of travel, and it is going to be extremely disruptive, extremely costly, uh, and um, really the best we could hope for is that we avoid the military conflict, we avoid that ultimate cost, uh, and are prepared to sort of be uh, rational in the sense of, of, of uh, arriving at a divorce that doesn't involve uh, uh, a shootout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well said. Uh, the concern, of course, and we haven't really talked about the Ukraine uh, invasion and, and what has happened there, but, but China is unfortunately kind of pulled into the, into the fray of this because you've got a, a desperate situation mounting, uh, you know, Putin and uh, his regime keep start trying to pull China into it and China keeps stepping back, but it has implications because they haven't necessarily fully declared their uh, alignment, though they've been, uh, you know, on record to have been supportive. So uh, how do you think that plays into this for China and is that going to accelerate or decelerate uh, the situation? What do you think the potential is there? It has uh, accelerated the decoupling. Uh, um, there's no two, two sort of ways about that. Uh, and it's also brought it to the forefront of, of uh, everyone in a way that it wasn't before the Ukraine conflict. And um, China and Russia have been cooperating, They're not allies in the natural sense of the word for a variety of reasons, but they have cooperated very closely. Uh, and uh, are becoming closer. And Putin made a gamble uh, that uh, really has not paid off. Um, essentially, if you think about it, um, if you, you know, there's the so called Kindleberger trap, where um, let's take the example of when the US was uh, 
contesting um, the UK or the British Empire as the hegemon. And but neither the British Empire was sort of any more uh, of the same strength, nor was the US ready to take on that role. And you had a power vacuum in which Germany actually took advantage and created, you know, what what with then became uh, the uh, Second World War. So there is this danger of when China is not yet ready the U uh, to, to be the hegemon and the US is no longer able to uh, fulfill its role uh, fully as it used to be in the past. Um, take, for example, the Middle East. Uh, and uh, then a middle power takes this as its advantage, which Russia tried to do with Ukraine. They miscalculated uh, on a number of fronts and created actually a big problem for China and for the US, uh, because a lot of the propaganda in Europe is trying to present the story as if uh, the Ukraine wall is a wall. war is beneficial for the US uh, because you know it feeds its basically money, you know. Um, but, but, but actually, I, I really reject that view. The US uh, is not, you know, is, is doesn't want the Ukraine war uh, to have happened and to go on. It distracts it. It's costly. Uh, it actually is not, um, it's not a, something that they would have sought to instigate, which is what the propaganda machine on the other side is trying to spread around Europe. But for China, it's also problematic because it looks like, I mean, that the uh, Russia could uh, lose, you know, that the likelihood of that happening is not insignificant. And certainly Russia is uh, quickly becoming an extremely diminished state. On the one hand, that's good for China because it can become even more the dominant partner in the relationship and have Russia as its vassal. Uh, but on the other, if Russia disintegrates, this presents a big problem for China because it loses that flag, which otherwise it keeps, it has secure. So if it has designs on Taiwan, it will feel much better uh, to be able to progress on that front if it has a, a sort of a stable Russia or a Russia that's not disintegrating. She has also personally staked a lot on Putin. So if Putin were to be replaced again, that introduces huge uncertainty for China. And that's partly why they've also kind of thrown themselves now into the role of peacemaker. Um, and of course, they're very partial side, so they're highly unlikely to achieve any progress. Uh, but um, I think probably potentially for them, a frozen conflict is, is, is in a way, the best case. Mm. And, and if you look at uh, Russia's economy, which is a completely separate topic, but obviously it's suffered tremendously. Uh, China, in some respects, is propping it up through oil and gas and some of the other things that they have bought. But uh, China's economy is not that strong and healthy at the moment either. So it's uh, it's helping your your failing brother to the to the north. How, how do you feel? You know, what, what do you think the implications of that's going to be? Because I don't think that's really sustainable. Uh, for Russia to keep relying on China, the cost of transportation of oil and gas, there's all kinds of implications, uh, but you've got China trying to play, uh, uh, you know, the, the arbiter in the middle of the situation, but then same token, they are trying to prop up uh, Russia's economy to the best of their ability, but uh, that seems to be a, a very uh, short-term game. Well, they've actually, I mean, the Chinese have benefited from that uh, tremendously, and they sort of um, seem to be striking good deals um, much more in favor of the Chinese side when it comes to both when we had the Crimea uh, takeover and now uh, with the full invasion of, of Ukraine and they're getting it, you know, getting all these resource, uh, resources uh, much cheaper. It is really Russia's, from, from kind of that economic relationship, it's Russia's economy that's uh, suffering uh, tremendously. And really, there, I don't see any future for Russia but to become a, a much more diminished state globally that has to rely on China. Um, and uh, the question is, will that will that satisfy Russia um, for the sake of kind of revenge on the West? Will it be enough? By the way, you know, just for disclosure, I'm not Russian. You know, I don't know if some people look at my name might think I am. Uh, I'm Bulgarian um, and actually one got a Czech, but anyway. Uh, and so I, to an extent, I do understand uh, the, the Russian mentality, uh, but um, 
I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say that uh, that um, it would surprise me uh, for them to kind of uh, now that they've ended up with this misfiring or, or miscalculated gamble to just really uh, do it for for revenge and not care. Um, and uh, from the perspective of China, it has, as I said, uh, it, it has benefited in many ways, but it has this huge risk that if Russia were to disintegrate, that will be a big problem. So yeah. I think it is not interested in that one. one year. And the other huge, huge issue is nuclear, uh, yeah. because, uh, of course, uh, Putin, the type of personality he is, the danger is he does detonate a tactical nuclear device, and uh, China is very much against that. Uh, so there is that that danger that they may not have the um, upper hand in, in ultimately um, influencing Russia and Putin in their response. Well, Diana Shaleva, it's been a really great pleasure and my honor to have you on the show today. Our audience has so many more questions. I certainly can't get to it, but we have lots of coaches at CEO Coaching International with extensive experience in China and the Mighty Five. So if anybody would like to go deeper or get some more answers to your specific questions, uh, please feel free to click the link and book a complimentary call with one of our experts to help address some of your specific questions. But again, thank you, Diana. It's been a very fruitful discussion. I really appreciate your time and your thoughtful answers answers to, uh, today. Thank you very much, Randy. It was my pleasure. And uh, I just wish I wasn't frozen for half of it, but then hey-ho. <laughs> it's a and little similar like to the situation, right? And we're not even a Chinese zone company. <laughs> All right. Take care. All the best. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye, everyone.